Well, I'm grateful today uh, that Colin Smith is joining us this morning and will be uh, preaching God's Word. So Colin is a senior pastor at the Orchard Church in Arlington Heights in Illinois, and he's here with his wife, Karen. And many of you know him, uh, the father of Dave Smith um, and their family. So Colin has preached here a number of times over the years. It's always a delight to have him with us. I know many of you have been encouraged by his ministry. And so thank you for being here this morning. We're eager to hear you preach. Um, so he'll be preaching from 1 Peter 1, and so I'll read this text, and then we'll pray, and then he'll come up and join us. So 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're so grateful for your word that you speak clearly and by your spirit transform us. And so we pray that you would uh, fill Pastor Smith with your spirit and that you would use your word to give comfort to those who need it. And where appropriate, uh, let it sting, but only to make us sing. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's always a joy for uh, Karen and I to be here. We love just sitting where you're sitting right now and benefiting from the ministry that you enjoy week by week from Pastor Drew. We're so grateful that our family are part of this fellowship and that his bright witness is being so obviously blessed widely for the praise and glory of God and for the advance of the gospel. It's a special privilege to be able to open the Bible with you on this uh, holiday uh, weekend, this Memorial Day uh, weekend. And uh, so if you would open uh, the scripture at the passage that has been read uh, for us, um, that would be uh, helpful. Um, First Peter chapter 1, and particularly I'm looking at verse 8, where Peter says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So now, Peter is writing to ordinary Christians. If you look at the uh, opening verses, you'll see there that they were ordinary Christians in various places. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's a fairly wide region. For us, that would be rather like saying believers in Indiana and Michigan and Ohio and Illinois. And what I want you to notice is that these believers were exactly like us, because Peter says that not one of them had ever seen Jesus. Notice what he says, verse 8, though you have not seen him. 
Now, of course, Peter had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. He'd had these marvelous experiences. Can you imagine how great it was for Peter? He was, was there when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. He, he was there when Jesus fed the 5,000 people. He was one of the disciples who actually took the food from the hand of Jesus as it was multiplied in Jesus' hand and distributed it to these little groups of 50 and 100 sitting on the green grass. He saw the risen Lord. Um, probably on six distinct occasions, he was there seeing the risen Lord Jesus Christ. He had seen Jesus, but these people to whom he writes were folks just like us. They had never seen Jesus. And Peter describes what was true of them and what is true of every true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this verse that I want to focus on today, there are three distinguishing marks of a Christian. These things are true of every believer. Notice first that we love him. Though you have not seen him, Peter says, you love him. And he doesn't say, you must love him. He says, you love him. This is one of the things that marks you as a genuine believer, that you have a true love for Jesus Christ in your heart. The heart of the Christian faith, as all of you know well, is a relationship with a living person. And Peter says that the people to whom he's writing, verse 3, have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So he makes it clear right from the beginning, I'm talking here about a living person. And the heart of what it means to be a Christian is that you come to love this living person. It reminds us that to be a Christian is more than believing a creed. To be a Christian is more than following a particular ethic or way of life. To be a Christian is a living relationship with a living person who you have come to love. Then the second distinguishing mark of a Christian believer in this verse is that you believe in him. Notice what he says, though you do not now see him, you believe in him. Now, this is remarkable. Again, he's not saying you must believe in him. He's saying the distinguishing mark, the thing that marks you out as a true believer is that you do believe in him. And, and what's very striking is that he says this immediately after pointing out that their faith in verse 7 has been grieved in various trials. And it may be that when Peter says, you do not now see him, it may be that what he means in that phrase is, right now, you can't see what he's doing. Anyone ever experienced that? Right now, you cannot see what he is doing. And of course, when a trial comes in your life and you're grieved by it, you often find yourself in this position. This is common Christian experience. You say, now, why is this happening? And, you know, kind people will sometimes stumble around trying to say helpful things that will give you an explanation. But when all is said and done, you feel that you are no further forward. You say, no, I don't get it. I, I really don't. I, I just don't understand it. Where is God in all of this? You do not now see him. You don't right now know what he is doing. And yet, Peter says, here is what marks you out as a genuine believer. That even though you experience trials in your life, and even though sometimes you cannot figure out what precisely God is doing, yet you love the Lord Jesus Christ, and even when you can't see what He's doing, you trust Him. You trust Him. Someone in my congregation said to me just recently, very perceptively, and she was in the middle of suffering uh, in a terminal 
uh, cancer, uh, which has now led to her being at home with the Lord, a young mom. And she said this to me, I'll never forget it. If I only love God when he gives me what I want, I do not really love him. It's very perceptive. When a couple get married, they take a vow. We pledge to our spouse to love in all circumstances, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. That's how it is with a believer's love for the Lord. If I love him only when he gives me what I want, then I do not really love him. And you know what? It's the same principle when it comes to our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If I only trust him when I can see what he's doing, well, then I don't really trust him. There was an Oxford professor by the name of Basil Mitchell, who told, I think, a helpful parable about the nature of faith. It goes like this. Picture yourself being in an occupied country in a time of war. And one night, you meet a stranger, and you get to know him. And he tells you that he is the leader of the resistance movement within your country that is occupied. And he tells you that he wants you to become part of that resistance movement. He wants you to be part of his work. And then he tells you, looks you straight in the eye, and he says, now I'm telling you now that the nature of my work is such that there will be certain times when you see me doing things that won't make any sense to you. You just won't understand them. And when these times come, he says, looking you in the eye, I want you to trust me. You give him your word that you will. But then as the months go by, you find that trusting isn't always so easy. Sometimes when on the means of communication you have in the resistance network, sometimes when you ask the stranger for help, you get an answer and he gives you what, he want, what you want. Other times it seems you don't get any response. Once in a while, you see the stranger talking with the enemy, and it makes you wonder, is he really on our side? Or did I get this all wrong? And then you remember he said to you, there will be times when I do things that you will not understand. And when those times come, I want you to trust me. And you said you would. Now, here is the distinguishing mark of a Christian, the second distinguishing mark that Peter lays before these ordinary believers who have never seen Jesus. And again, he's not saying, now you must trust him. He's saying, you do. And this marks you out as a Christian. You really love him. You truly love him from the heart. And even though you cannot always figure out what he's doing, you, you trust him. You really do. And this marks you out as a genuine believer. And then notice the third thing here, uh, third mark of a true believer, that we find joy in him. Though you do not see him now, you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now, wonderful phrase. So, an inexpressible joy is a joy that nobody could put into words. So I can't do better than that. It's an inexpressible joy. You can't put it into words. And Peter says it is a joy that is filled with glory. So it is a joy, therefore, that comes from knowing the glory that lies ahead and the glory that has already begun to shine into your life in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter's already referred to this in verse 6. Um, where he says, in this you rejoice. Well, what is it that we rejoice in? Well, look back again to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to what? A living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. You rejoice because you have a living hope. And Peter tells us two things about this living hope that brings us such joy. He says we have an inheritance verse 4, that is kept in heaven for you. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, and it is unfading. What Jesus Christ has prepared for each and every one of us in this place of worship today, it can never perish, it can never spoil, and it can never diminish. It can never, never fade. It will not disappoint you. And notice that Jesus keeps this inheritance for you. It is kept in heaven for you. So Jesus has the inheritance, and he holds it, as it were, in his hand, and he keeps it for you. And then Peter says, not only is the inherit does he keep the inheritance for you, but he keeps you for the inheritance, because he says, you are being guarded through faith by God's power, verse 4. So think about this. The Lord Jesus Christ holds the inheritance for you, as it were, in one hand. And the Lord Jesus Christ guards and keeps you and holds you for the inheritance, as it were, in the other hand. And one day, on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is going to bring together what right now he is holding in his hands. And the inheritance will be yours. And it's glorious and in this you rejoice. Now, this joy runs right through these verses. Verse 7, Peter speaks about how your faith will result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Love that phrase, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, when Peter refers to the revelation of Jesus Christ, he's referring to his second coming, his glorious return. But here he doesn't use the word return or the word uh, coming. He uses the word revelation. He's referring to the same thing, but he uses this particular word. So what is the difference or the significance of, of using the word revelation here? Well, you all know that when you have a reveal at the end of a show or at the end of a project, um, it is the unveiling of something that is already there. That's the point about a reveal. It unveils what is already there. And there's a scholar by the name of Alan Stibbs who very beautifully says that the revelation, the reveal, of the Lord Jesus Christ is, and I quote, not the coming of someone hitherto absent, but the visible unveiling of someone who has been all the time spiritually and invisibly present. Isn't that beautiful? Brother, sister, you have never seen Jesus, but he is always with you. Every moment of every day, and when you arrive in glory, it will not be a stranger that you will see. It will be the unveiling of the one who every step of the way in your life here on earth has been invisibly and spiritually present with you all the time. His revelation, his unveiling. You're going to see face to face the one who you've loved and trusted and rejoiced in. These things have been heart to heart, but you're going to see him face to face. And Peter says, when you do, you're just going to be filled with an inexpressibly glorious joy. So, here are three wonderful distinguishing marks of an authentic believer. 
Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and you rejoice with an inexpressible uh, joy that is filled with glory. We, we, we love Christ, we trust Christ, and we rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love him because of who he is. Uh, we trust him because of all that he's done and all that he's doing, and we rejoice in him because of all that he's prepared and all that he holds in his hand stored up for us. Now, that's the message of this wonderful verse. I want to ask two questions by way of application. The first is why, and the second is how. Why would it be that these things are true of you? Why would it be that you love and trust and rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ? Why would that be? How would such a thing have come to pass? Why would that be true of you when clearly it's not true of many other people that you know and even love? Why? And then the second question will be how? So someone sitting here this morning said, I'm not sure I love Jesus. I'm not sure I trust Jesus. I'm not sure I find very much joy in Jesus. How then could these distinguishing marks of a true believer become true in my life? So why? And how? First, why? Why do we love Jesus? Why do you trust Jesus? If that's true of you, why do you rejoice in Jesus? We look back at verse 3 where the answer is very clear. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you see that phrase and how striking it is? He says of ordinary believers distributed over this area, people who've never seen Jesus, people just like us, here's what's true of you. God has caused you to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. God did something to bring you to the place where it can truly be said that you love Jesus, you trust Jesus, and you find joy in Jesus. Now, let me try and just illustrate this very briefly from the, the Christmas story that's just so familiar to uh, all of us. Think, think about this. Uh, Bethlehem is sound asleep on the night when the Lord Jesus Christ was born. To the vast majority of people, the coming of Jesus Christ into the world on that night didn't make a scrap of difference. The next day just carried on precisely the same. The one exception that we're told about on that night, of course, was the group of shepherds out in their fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night, and they have love for Jesus they believe in Jesus. They have joy in Jesus as they come to the manger. Why was that? The answer is very obvious. It was because of something God did. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone all around them. And these shepherds had love for Jesus. They had trust in Jesus. They had joy in Jesus because of something God did. What difference did the coming of Jesus into the world make to the, 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 the kings of the world in those days? Well, the vast majority of them paid absolutely no attention whatsoever. One king, of course, was absolutely enraged and tried to destroy the Lord Jesus right from the beginning. But you remember that there were three kings who loved Jesus and believed in Jesus and evidently had joy in Jesus and came to worship him, three kings from the east and why was it that they had this love and faith and, and joy? Well, you know the answer. It was something that God did. God led them by a star that came to rest right over the place where Jesus lay. So the love and the faith and the joy of the shepherds and of the kings was a clear and direct result of something that God did. And what Peter is telling us here is that precisely the same is true for ordinary Christians like us who have never once even seen Jesus. 
How was it that we came to love Jesus and to trust him and to find joy in him? Well, it's because of something that God did. He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Think about this, dear friends. Why are we here this morning? There are so many things in this world and in this life to do. We're here in large measure because we love Jesus, we trust Jesus, we find joy in Jesus. And why is that true of you, brother? Why is that true of you, sister, when there are millions of people in the world who have no love for him, no trust in him, and no joy in him whatsoever? Is it really that you are smarter than everyone else? Is it that you're wiser than everyone else? Better than everyone else? God caused you to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That miracle has happened in your life. It may have happened in the quietest possible way. You may not be able to put a date on it or a time on it or to specify events, but the evidence that it has happened is that you love Jesus. And you trust Jesus. And you have joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder Peter then says, as we would say this morning, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's done this. And that is why the whole of the rest of your Christian life will be lived out of a sense of wonder, a sense of joy, a sense of gratitude that God inexplicably has had mercy on you and brought new life into you. That's why. It's very clear in this verse. And that leads, of course, to the last question, which is how. Someone then says, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute then. How then can that be true of me? And some of you may have puzzled over this question. You're a thoughtful congregation, as the congregation I'm privileged to serve are very thoughtful people. And it may have occurred to you to ask this question, if it is God who brings the new life, God who gives the new life that brings a person to love Jesus, trust Jesus, and find joy in Jesus, if it's God who does that, then uh, how is a person who's not yet there? What, what, what is such a person to do? There might be someone who actually is asking that question in a very personal way uh, right now. Um, how then can this gift be mine? And if someone asks you that question, how are you going to answer? I, I'm actually going to assume that there is someone here today, this morning, who's actually asking this question. You look around at other people, and you can see that other people really do love Jesus. They really do. And you can see that there are other people here who really do trust Jesus. It's, it's, they do. And they have evident joy in Jesus. Jesus. And so you have begun to recognize that some other people have something that you don't yet have, and you're asking the question, um, well, how can this be mine? And you're, you're looking at this verse, and you're saying, okay, I see that it's God who gives this. So if God is the one who gives this, how, how, how am I to get it? That's the question. And I want you to think about the answer to that question by asking you another question. How do you know that God has not given it to you already? See, think about it. If you have any interest at all in Jesus, 
If you have any sense sitting here this morning, right now, that there just might be some hope for you in Him, if you feel, even in a small degree, the, the birth of a desire that He should be in your life, I would say that's a pretty clear sign that God is at work in your life. Wouldn't you say that? Where did that come from? See, there may be others who are just completely unresponsive to God, but right now, not you. Right now, actually, there's something that really is stirring within you. And it may not always have been like this. You know, the truth may be that Memorial Day weekend a, a year ago, you would not have had this interest. But right now, actually, something is beginning to grow within your heart and within your life. And you're being drawn in some way that you don't fully understand. Your interest is now engaged. It might be that for someone... You had no real interest in having Jesus Christ in your life when you parked your car in the parking lot and that the reason that you're here is basically that someone you love believes and you want to keep them happy. And that's why you came. And you walked into this building without thinking anything other than what you're going to do after the service is done. And yet right now, that's not where you're at. You're thinking, there may be something that Jesus Christ has for me, and I'd like to have it. And I'd say that's a pretty good evidence that God is at work in your heart right now. Don't you see, dear friend, that this is precisely how people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And right now it's evidently happening to you. So what should you do? Well, again, let me answer that question just very briefly by pointing you to a little story that gives a very clear answer. The Gospels tell us about a time when Jesus was in the town of Jericho, and he was leaving, and his disciples are around him. There was a huge crowd around him as well, lots of people, and there was a blind man and his name was Bartimaeus, and he was sitting at the side of the road. And you think, what hope does that man ever have of getting to Jesus? I mean, first, he's blind. Second, even if he could see, Jesus is on the move. He's surrounded by a great crowd of people. I mean, how's the man to have any hope of ever getting to Jesus? And in the Gospels, we read that this man, blind Bartimaeus, cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's a great prayer, by the way. Jesus, have mercy on me. And Mark tells us that Jesus stopped. And Jesus said, call him. And they called the blind man, this is Mark 10 and verse 49, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you love that. Take heart, get up. He is calling you. And then Mark tells us very simply that this blind man, throwing off his cloak, sprang up and came to Jesus. He came to Jesus to give him what he did not have, and Jesus restored his sight, and Bartimaeus became a follower of Jesus. Listen, if you are drawn in any way towards the Lord Jesus Christ today, it is because He is calling you to love Him, to trust Him, and to find joy in Him. And you may be saying, well, I, how am I ever to get to Jesus? You may be saying, oh, I feel that I've been so far away from him. It just feels too great a distance for me to cross. I don't even know if I can live this Christian life. And now you have all these questions. You're drawn, but you have all these questions. I'm saying to you, take heart, get up. He is calling you. Here's what you must do. And here's what by his grace you can do. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust yourself to Him. 
love the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? That is not so hard because it is His love that is drawing you, and it is amazing what you can give up for love. You know, if you find yourself saying, well, there are probably going to be some sins here that I'm going to have to give up, you're absolutely right. But it is amazing what you can do for love. And when your soul gets filled with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will have the strength and you will have the desire to overcome sins that have beset you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Love Him with a love that reflects the great love that He has for you. And as you believe in Him, as you love Him, you will find joy in Him. And what Peter says is true of every genuine believer will become true of you, that though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for the miracle of grace by which You have brought hundreds in this room, thousands in this community, and millions in this world, and billions throughout history, to living faith and to eternal life in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you are the God who saves. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for causing new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Seal and advance your work in our hearts and in the hearts of those who feel drawn in a special way this morning. Grant that as we trust Christ, so this new wonderful life that you give may grow bringing love and peace and joy and all that flows from your hand. Hear our prayers and advance your great saving work in each of our lives. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen.